Welcome everybody to the City Club. I'm very excited to introduce our speaker. My name is Chris Sepper. I run MedCity Media. MedCity Media is a Cleveland-born product that publishes MedCityNews.com, which covers national innovation across healthcare, new devices, new drugs, innovations in technology and healthcare, and the thought leadership on the big challenges that are going to transform healthcare in this great century. Um, and I am very fortunate to introduce one of those innovators. His name is Lars Sorensen. He is the CEO of Novo Nordisk. Uh, a little bit about Novo, it is the number one maker of insulin and it's a company that's been working on diabetes since the 1920s. Um, it is also involved in hemophilia, hormone therapy, obesity, and actually one of the most notable things happened one week ago when the company invested, announced that they would invest more than $3.6 billion to develop six new diabetes drugs in the next several years. It's a transformative company focusing on new ways to deliver insulin solve diabetes and solve obesity, some of the biggest problems in healthcare. Um, and Lars himself has been leading this company for quite some time. He's worked for Novo um, in the United States and the Middle East. Uh, he joined their management team in 1994 and finally became CEO in 2000. Um, thank you very much for joining us and please give a warm welcome to Lars Sorensen. Thank you so much, Chris, and ladies and gentlemen, thank you for inviting me uh, this evening. It's, it's a great honor, and a, a little bit anxiety provoking uh, when I saw the, uh, the picture Hall of Fame wall out there to, uh, to understand who, I, who have been standing on this podium and dressing you. So if you'd bear with me, uh, I don't have the background that these guys have, uh, but uh, who am I really? Uh, I, was, I was reminded of when I prepare for this of Steve Jobs' address to the, the graduating students at uh, Stanford University, where he talks about, his, his talk is, a, is actually about connecting the dots. And uh, this is only something that you can do when you look backwards and not looking forward. And uh, so I tell you, I'm a forester of education. That may surprise you running a global pharmaceutical company. I, I, when I graduated from high school, I intended, well, my imagination could not stretch further than perhaps I should become an engineer just like my dad. Um, I hope there's not too many engineers here. Uh, <laughs> but I found it extraordinarily boring when I went to engineering school. So about three months after starting, I dropped out and, and it, went back to my school educating uh, undergraduate school children, considering what I should do. One thing which was cool for a young guy to do was becoming a pilot. Uh, then I realized, uh, also considering uh, commercial flights these days, that the uh, pilot is probably not going to be so exciting at the end. Uh, a lot of people in my family are employed in medicine, uh, either at the nurse level or at the physician level and uh, I had worked already at that time five years in a hospital as a janitor and, and cooking for the patients and serving the patients and I was not really impressed with the way that the lower staff was was treated and the patients either for that matter uh, so I dropped uh, medicine as well and chose forestry uh, which is sort of like a semi-military education which suited my maturity level uh, I was being told basically what to do and cut trees and spend a lot of energy uh, doing so. And uh, now I really enjoy uh, doing my own gardening and I enjoy uh, traveling all over the world and look at nature. I fly all the time and my job is in medicine. <laughs> so this was of course never to be understood unless uh, you really look backwards. Then I'm a keen bicyclist. I'm actually here uh, because I was going to go to Death Valley and ride a century together with 25 of my colleagues. Uh, we do that every year. I invite my colleagues. Uh, I pay for their entry fee and all they have to do is sweat it out in Death Valley. And then that money goes to JDRF uh, for research into type 1 diabetes. Now I can't go because the government has shot the park. <laughs> So, one of the consequences of shutting down the government is that JDRF is going to miss $2 million because there's going to be no ride this weekend. 
And we're all very disappointed, uh, but not more disappointed than we're going to come back next year and do it again next year. So as you can appreciate, I'm a fan also of the U.S. I have worked in the U.S. Uh, as part of my career, six years. And during those years, I met my wife at the YMCA in Wilton, Connecticut. She's Swedish. My first child is born here. And so, and I even have a small cottage in Connecticut, which I'm looking forward to when I'm not going to work as much as I do right now, uh, to be spending more time at. In 2000, I became the CEO of Novo Nordisk. And Novo Nordisk is an interesting company in that it's a Danish company. And Denmark is a place where there is not supposed to live people. When people migrated uh, from the south of Europe, where the climate is nice, there's lots of wine and meat and agriculture, they got lost, they got trapped, they couldn't get anywhere. Uh, they were at the end of Europe, uh, and this is where Denmark is. So there's not, not a whole lot there. <laughs> uh, today, uh, there's about 5 million people and about 25 million pigs living uh, in Denmark. <laughs> So we have, a, we have a rather large agricultural industry. I've always had a large agricultural industry, much like some of the states in the United States. And so we had to get by with our own brains and what the land could, could bear. And that has uh, implications for my company because when insulin was discovered in 1921 in Canada, some ingenious people brought the know-how back uh, to Denmark. And based on agricultural raw materials, in our case, uh, slaughterhouse waste, when the, when the pigs were slaughtered, the, the pancreas was taken out, frozen down, and we could extract the insulin from the pancreas and make that as a preparation for people with diabetes and hence save their life. That started in 1923. Later on, uh, by combining uh, the know-how from the brewing industry, which does fermentation, our company learned how to manufacture penicillin just right after the war. And with the advent of modern biotechnology, uh, our company were able to rid itself of having to collect all these glands from all over the world, which you can appreciate is problematic, uh, just for transportation reasons, but also during conflicts. How could you collect this during wars? But also because of the reason that uh, animal tissue may have infections with viruses which could contaminate the products. Uh, with modern biotechnology, it was enabled us to produce infinite amounts of this in baker's yeast. So we manufacture insulin in simple baker's yeast. We've done a few alterations to the yeast, though, and we ferment it in big tanks, and we can produce all the world's demand of insulin. In the process, our company has developed over the years, and due to the sad fact that diabetes is such a big problem, we have become the biggest market cap in Scandinavia, and one of the biggest economic contributors to the Danish economy. And it's a great privilege, of course, uh, to work with my 35,000 colleagues and have such an impact uh, on the national economy, uh, but certainly also on the diabetes community. Our mission is to change diabetes, uh, because our customers are people with diabetes. And what they want, they want to get rid of their disease, and they want to be able to live normal lives like everybody else. And so our remit is uh, to try to do whatever we can. We offer a full range of insulins, from generic insulins to some of the latest and most modern insulins. And what I usually tell people is, I can get you the best insulins in the world, but I can also give you generic insulin for the cost of a cup of coffee. So we sell our insulins all over the world at what you could equate to the cost daily treatment of a cup of coffee. So it's not the cost of the medicine which is preventing people from getting the therapy. It is healthcare systems, it's lack of knowledge, lack of awareness. But we do understand that different parts of the world, it's very difficult to get access to medical treatment. And as a consequence of this, we developed 10 years ago uh, an institution we call the World Diabetes Foundation. So every vial of insulin, every cartridge of insulin we sell, a couple of pennies goes to this independent institution uh, that's the biggest funding agency for building healthcare capacity in developing countries. So we have, over those 10 years, built more than 1,000 clinics in developing countries. Only 
doing education and awareness, helping people understand the threats of diabetes and how to cope with it. And then at the same time, the company has pledged to offer our products at cost to the poorest countries in the world, meaning that the 50 poorest countries in the world, they can buy it what it costs for us to manufacture. I don't want to give, I don't believe in philanthropy. I know it's controversial in the United States because I don't think philanthropy is sustainable. Uh, I believe I want to have the cost associated with manufacturing my products cost they covered but apart from that I don't want to make profit on the poorest people in the world so we have a we have a huge uh, research activity uh, in the area and uh, I'll, I'll come back to this uh, but diabetes and chronic disease is not just medication it is public awareness and so we do a lot of public awareness programs all over the world trying to gather politicians, people from Treasury, those that sit on the money and the purse for the budgets, uh, the educators, healthcare professionals, the patient associations, and try to find strategies that would work for any community. Some communities, finances is the obstacle, other communities, education is the obstacle, other communities, it's the healthcare capacity, lack thereof, that's the problem. So we try to deal with that and offer them our understanding how this is being done elsewhere so that they can develop strategies uh, for their local populations. We also have programs here in Cleveland and my colleagues uh, are here tonight from Cleveland uh, and these programs are patient oriented in terms of diabetes children camps, uh, patient programs where we educate the patients and their families and, and how to cope with being all of a sudden having a chronic disease and living a, a very challenging life with that. Uh, and, uh, and these programs are basically been developed by my colleagues uh, to be adapted to the environment you have here in Cleveland, but they're basically built on the back of experience from elsewhere. Now, what can I tell you other than the things that you already know? I don't really know. I'm not a politician, I'm not an economist, I'm not standing here as a representative of Pharma, the Manufacturers Association in America. Uh, they have not endorsed my comments and they never will. <laughs> um, I, I understood this was a podium or soapbox for free speech and this is what you're going to get. What I get afterwards uh, will be uh, my responsibility. <laughs> uh, um, I don't speak on behalf of the general pharmaceutical industry either. I speak as a CEO of Novo Nordisk, and as, as myself. And I speak to you uh, as a friend of the US, and someone who loves this country enough to care. My experience and my focus is in one of the biggest public health problems that we have ever faced. Ban Ki-moon uh, stated in this way, when he addressed the UN Assembly in November of 2011 that diabetes is a tsunami in slow motion. It is devastating countries. It is a burden which even is a burden to the richest country in the world, United States, to Europe, but it's even a bigger burden to developing countries. There are more deaths caused by diabetes in developing countries than HIV, AIDS, and malaria, and TB. This is not to belittle those problems, but these countries have a double burden. They share infectious disease as well as chronic disease. So the fundamental question though is to start with, before we start debating is, is this world developing into a better place or a worse place to be in? With our young people here, and uh, they shouldn't be too depressed. Uh, let me declare uh, for transparency, I believe it's a better place. Now, this requires some qualifications. Global warming, scary as it is, at least we're talking about it. Many countries are setting targets for CO2 emission. Even the United States is beginning to adopt uh, the agenda of the fact that we need to reduce energy consumption to reduce CO2 emission because it might have a detrimental impact on our climate. Overpopulation. Any of you reading Dan Brown's Inferno? Well, if you take it down, 
the whole premise is somebody wants to do the world a favor by killing a third of the population by releasing a plague because they're concerned that overpopulation is eventually going to kill the human race. Now, I don't believe that to be the right scenario. Of course, there's overpopulation, but this is usually associated in societies where there's lack of education and lack of wealth and social systems. We have economic hard times in Europe, the United States, in cities, but we should remember that we are having a giant wealth transfer to millions and millions, if not billions of people elsewhere, which life's existence has been very, very difficult. And as a consequence of that, they're having large families, like we did. When our societies uh, were not able to care for us, when we didn't have social security, when we didn't have jobs. But when they are going to start to grow, and their economies are going to start to grow, they're going to have smaller and smaller families. So overpopulation is not going to be a problem. Energy distribution, an interesting thing, uh, having worked in the Middle East and knowing the importance of the Middle East, to see the redistribution of the resources with the exploration of shale gas and energy in the United States have transform the political landscape and bought us time in which we can innovate and solve some of these problems. So as you will see, all the challenges that I've mentioned are in a way linked. And their solutions are also linked. If we consume more wisely, if we use our bodies to stay healthy, if we use our minds to innovate, if we share our wealth, then we can create the foundation for a more peaceful world in the future. Now, this requires reform. Reform it at an individual level and reform at societal level. And that, we know, is painful. Um, it's painful for families uh, to adjust to their means if one of the breadwinners are losing their jobs. It's painful for, for companies to restructure and close businesses. It's much more fun to grow businesses and, and hire employees and open plants. It is painful for cities to go bankrupt. It's painful for countries to reform entitlements and change economic structures. But we do it all the time, ladies and gentlemen, in every family in every company, in every community, and in every country, we do it all the time. So we can do it again. If you look at Europe and Japan, these are economies that are not growing at the moment. They're also aging. So we have huge challenges. Whereas if we look at emerging markets uh, as a proxy for that, you can take India, you can take Mexico, you can take the Philippines, you can take China. They're young and they're dynamic, and their growth will fuel a demand for healthcare services, for innovation, for technology, for human skills, for capital, for finance, which is going to come from us to a large extent, and that's going to fertilize our communities. If we look at the U.S., it is still the largest economy in the world. The way I see it from a European perspective, it's a young nation, and you have a different age distribution than we have. You are willing and you have been showing over the years to you can assimilate immigrants. You're innovative, you're risk willing, and you have the leading educational institutions in the world. In other words, you have everything you need if you're willing to accept and address some of the imbalances you have in your society. I know that you are currently having a debate in the country about your global role. Uh, I don't blame you. Uh, after the experiences you've had of patrolling the world morale uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan, one thing you, you may not be aware of is uh, in Denmark we have the same debate. As small as we are as a country, we have participated uh, in both uh, scenarios and we've taken also relatively to our size heavy losses, and a lot of people are questioning why are we doing this? What, what's, the, what's, the, what's the reason for doing this? But let me tell you, 
the Danes are extraordinarily grateful to the role that the U.S. played in liberating Europe and ending the World War II. But also subsequent to that, for the relentless opposition and pressure you put on totalitarian communist regime during the Cold War. That is why I think the Danes, because we were occupied in the Second World War, and we were just next door to Eastern Europe during the Cold War, have participated in the recent conflicts, and we will do so again if called upon as part of the free world. That is why, ladies and gentlemen, I believe the world has become a better place to be in and not a worse place to be in. Sometimes we cloud our own obstacles and adversity and see it as things are really going to go bad, but they ain't. Now let me just finally uh, touch a little bit uh, on, on health care uh, and health. In that regard, I think the world is also converging somehow. I, I live in a system of socialized medicine. And uh, I know that this has been portrayed in, in America as death penalty and death panels and, and things like this. I'm, I'm still alive and, and doing well. I would, I would say, though, that it is not entirely rosy. Uh, we have our challenges in, in our system, which is tax funded. So basically, we all pay taxes, and the tax has been redistributed to schools and roads and health care. And um, as a consequence of this, we have a certain lack of innovation of the latest medical innovation. There's no doubt about that. Latest, the newest procedures are not being done with us. The newest medication is not being used by us. Uh, there's rationing uh, in that sense, and there's also a waiting list for people, say hip transplantations and things like this. Uh, there are waiting lists. So this is a disadvantage. If we look at the U.S., uh, you can get anything here. The latest technology, there's no waiting list. You go right in there if you have money. And, uh, but the, you have to question yourself whether you are getting enough out of your spending. There's no country in the world that spends as much on health care as the United States. Um, but if you look at life expectancy and child mortality and lost life years and the productive years, you're trailing a number of countries which are paying far less than you. So there is something to be done about health care in the United States. I'm not an expert in U.S. healthcare systems. The only thing that, that I at least can observe is that I think it's something to do with the fact uh, that the healthcare system, at least up until now, has been built on a fee-for-service basis. So the more service you give, the more cost. And because it's a very litigious uh, environment as well, and I know there's maybe lawyers here, so I, you can throw rocks at me uh, later. Uh, <coughs> then that adds to the cost because the physician, of course, wants to make sure that uh, we're not being charged of not having done what we could. And then I think also one of the, the challenges you have is that you have the social inequity, meaning that most of the healthcare spend is probably spent by the middle class and the upper class, whereas the lower social groups uh, are incurring less uh, of the services but they are the ones that are incurring a lot of the productivity losses, uh, which is translated into mortality and lost life year and child mortality. I believe, as I understand it, that the Affordable Care Act uh, is attempting to remedy some of this. I don't know where it's going. Uh, the pharmaceutical industry so far has been trying to support the act by paying up front. We're now looking to see whether it's going to be enacted, that changes are going to be put in place so that more people, more patients, uh, will be put into care, which is the upside uh, for the pharmaceutical industry. If we look at China, it's an interesting example. They've gone completely 180 degrees from being totally totalitarian communism uh, that decided on what you get and what, what not everybody can get, nobody will get, uh, that's the system, uh, to become, in a way, a market which is much more similar to the U.S. Most of the healthcare costs in China are borne by the individual, except for catastrophic hospitalization. Chronic uh, disease patients, they pay basically out of pocket, everything themselves. This is, of course, not sustainable either. Uh, they are having 
issues with social instability as a consequence of this. So they're trying to move in a direction of where they also want to offer some general services, uh, some general uh, social services, and offer some more support for healthcare. So all in all, all societies are aiming at the same thing, which is providing equal basic health care for all, while stimulating initiatives that support behavioral modification, which preserves health, while at the same time providing services which are deemed to be appropriate by society as effectively as possible. All nations are looking for the same. We're coming at it from different angles. I think I've already sp spoken long enough. Uh, thank you uh, so much for your attention, if you have. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm now willing to uh, uh, leave the, the, the charge of this uh, to the moderator and take uh, the, his question or yours, whatever. Thanks. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we are listening to Special Business Leaders Series program featuring Lars Sorensen, the President and CEO of Novo Nordisk. We will return to our speaker momentarily for our traditional City Club question and answer period. We encourage you to formulate questions for our speaker now and remind you that your questions should be brief and to the point. We welcome all of you here and those listening to WCPN 90.3 FM, WCLV, WTAM, or one of the many radio stations across the country. Our television broadcast partners are WVIZ PBS IdeaStream. Television broadcasts of the City Club are made possible by Cleveland State University and PNC. Our live webcast is supported by the University of Akron. Today we welcome guests today at tables hosted by sponsors of the Business Leaders Series, Falls Communications, Huntington Bank, Humana, Inside Business, and Meaden and Moore. Thank you for your support. Please join us for the next program in the Business Leaders Series. The Happy Hour event will be held November 1st at Aloff Hotel and will feature John Campbell, Executive Director for Waterfront Toronto. Mr. Campbell will discuss the success of the Lakefront investment in Toronto and the opportunity for similar investment in Cleveland. For more information about our upcoming forums, to make a reservation or to order a CD or DVD of today's program, please refer to our website, www.cityclub.org. Now we would like to return to our speaker for our traditional City Club question and answer period. We welcome questions from everyone, including guests. Holding the microphone today is Program Director Carrie Miller in the back. First question, please. I have, I have many, so. <laughs> and I also would like to say it's a pleasure that we are the only two not wearing ties. Yeah, well, yes, we, <laughs> and we didn't even coordinate it. We did not coordinate it. Uh, you, know, you know, you um, you talked about many amazing things, and, and as somebody uh, whose company in many ways relies on the success of the problems of diabetes and obesity, uh, I'm fascinated by the solutions, because in the end, it seems that in healthcare, the bottom line is people will pay whatever they can to keep doing what they're doing. Because the problems of obesity and diabetes are very straightforward. Now they're social, um, but they also have to do with exercise, proper diet, behavioral issues, and socioeconomic issues. Uh, but in the end, people will opt for a lap band surgery, or they'll look for a pill that might take 6% off of their weight loss, or they'll look for an insulin treatment, or hope that somebody will create a pill that'll create insulin easier. Um, when you look at the issue, what are the true problems, and, and are pills, devices, Surgical procedures simply masking some of the real problems, or are they assisting the real problems when it comes to this issue of obesity and diabetes? Yeah, Chris, uh, <clears throat> I have to disappoint you that I disagree with you on your <laughs> premise. Uh, I think you're, under, you're underestimating uh, human nature. I mean, we wouldn't have gotten this far if we were that stupid. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I think, and, and we see signs of this in, in basically in all communities that if you give people education, if you give them knowledge, if you take away some of the, uh, the burdens that they, they have from an economic uh, perspective, uh, which takes all their energy, uh, then they will start to live more sensible lives. Mm. Uh, of course, it's, it's a long-term project. It starts with childhood. 
how we educate our children and how our children are growing up. I mean, we've got to turn back the clock to how it was perhaps 50, 60 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we have a leading newspaper in Denmark that every morning uh, shows pictures from 50 years ago and, and 100 years ago. When they show the pictures from 50 years ago, they, everybody's skinny. <laughs> uh, and that was because they lived in a way from a metabolic perspective a more healthy life. And so there's no reason why we could not emulate that if we change everything we do. If we change education, if we change curriculum in school, if we change, uh, if we change our urban design, uh, that's all we have to do. We've got to make the healthy choices, the easy choices. We've got to perhaps regulate on food advertisement and labeling. There's a whole host of things that we, we need to do right, but these are things that we can do. And then there's another premise which, is, which is, is, is also wrong, and that is to consider, for instance, uh, obesity as just a lack of personal willpower to shut the mouth and not stuff food in the mouth. Uh, in many cases, it is... Uh, it's much more complex than this. It can be genetically uh, predisposed, uh, and it can sometimes, if you put the weight on, it's much, much harder to lose the weight again, and the metabolism has been, has been changed in a way by which it is much more difficult for these individuals to sustainably lose and maintain a lower body weight than normal individuals. And furthermore, all diabetics are not people that have gotten diabetes out of a lifestyle and in, in a bad environment. I'm, first of all, we have people with type 1 diabetes, you should remember. Uh, I mean, they, they live completely healthy lives, uh, but all of a sudden succumb to the need of, of having to have insulin. So I think the problems are significantly more complex. Uh, but of course, we, as pharmaceutical companies, uh, our remit is to try to make medical innovation that can assist people in living normal and productive lives. And, and this is also why that in the, in the space of obesity, it's been so difficult to get, first of all, regulatory approval of, of new drugs, uh, because the agency and the medical profession has by and large looked at obesity as an issue that was a social issue and, and not a medical issue. This has changed very recently, which is a good thing. Uh, so I, I fundamentally believe that we should try to avoid becoming sick. And there's enough people in the world that has diabetes, where we sell our products, that I don't need to propagate that we should just eat fast food and, and drink sugary soft drinks so that we can get more customers. I mean, if you look at the world today, 50% of the people with diabetes in the world hasn't even been diagnosed. Mm -hmm. And out of those 50% that are diagnosed, only 50% of the world has access to proper health care. And out of those 50% that have access to proper health care, only 50% gets the right outcome. So if you take the math down, under 10% of the global population of about 370 million people with diabetes get a proper outcome of their treatment. This, if you translate this into individual human cost, because people get disability from diabetes, they lose their life, they become indisposed, they come, become dependent on the rest of their family or society, it's a huge cost and there's lots and lots of business. So I don't need to promote diabetes. There's enough yeah. business for all of us in this. What I, and, and since I'm 80% of my business is in diabetes, and you know, if, if I were to tell the customers, you know, all you need to do is you need to use my next product, then you'll be fine. That's not what they want. They want to get rid of their diabetes. So if I were not advocating on their behalf for what should be done to pre prevent people from getting diabetes, I would not be a credible partner and business uh, partner with them. So, no. Uh, I think it's far more complex uh, than, than, than what you described. I'm sorry. No, this is good. <laughs> That's why I asked the question. The question's the eyes. One question. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Sorensen. Um, I'm just interested to hear your um, thoughts around biosimilars uh, in the United States. Uh, there was a, uh, some attempt at legislation in California. I'm just curious to see what your position is on, on similar drugs. Well, obviously in the bios, bio, biologic space, uh, there will eventually be uh, legislation so that it is feasible to develop uh, and, and there's clarity on development of biologic generics, if you want, or biosimilars as they're being called. Uh, because that's the whole logic about the patent laws is that you can have a patent and you can ha have exclusivity for a certain period of time. And then after the patent expires, somebody else can repeat your innovation and bring these products to the market, uh, perhaps at a lower price than the originator, and, and that drives a cycle of innovation. So uh, this will eventually happen. In, in the case of insulins, I think what we are likely to see is that it's going to be a, a competition between what we call the incumbent players. Uh, so uh, it will be between ourselves, Eli Lilly and, and Sanofi, who are the leading uh, suppliers of, of insulin in the United States, uh, that will, when our products runs off patent, we can compete with each other uh, on generic terms. Uh, but at the same time, we, as we are pursuing to develop even better insulins. So this is likely to, to benefit uh, society in the form of uh, more attractive costs for those generic products, and it's our obligation to come up with drugs that are better. Very simple. Mr. Sorensen, thank you for being here. Um, you mentioned in your remarks that um, the United States kind of lags in terms of healthcare um, uh, benchmarks, in terms of outcomes. Um, I suggested that there might be more of a health problem in the United States rather than a health care problem. Um, do you disagree with that? And, and if you, you agree that maybe there's a societal health problem, are there any examples globally that we can look to to say th this nation does a really good job with health reform? Yeah, I, I, th I think you're, you're right. I mean, you have to be sick before the health care really kicks in. And, and then, of course, it's my comments were to, to the extent to which uh, do you get enough results out of that? Um, I think there are community-based intervention programs in, amongst other in Finland that has demonstrated that it is possible at a community level to reduce obesity, which is a risk factor for developing uh, type 2 diabetes and, and other uh, illnesses and cardiovascular disease and cancer. Uh, so I think there are, there are examples of how you can do this. But uh, there's also pain associated. You, you have to say no to certain things, and you, and you have to accept uh, prohibition of certain things in school, and you have to change the school programs. And, and, and so, but, but I, I don't think it's necessarily that we don't need know what we need to do. It's just there are so many interests involved uh, that are trying to prevent us from doing it. And then there's, of course, the economic factors of, in economic hard times, uh, people are more insecure in their job. They have to drive longer to get uh, to a new job. And, and all those things which, which puts a strain on individuals uh, and prevents them from, from li living a more healthy life. So, yeah, I think, I mean, if you look at the obesity, America has been leading the world in terms of obesity which is, of course, not a healthcare as such problem, but it's something that's going to drive healthcare costs. Uh, you're no longer in the lead there. Uh, Mexico has taken over being the leading country in, in, in obesity in the world, and we see the European countries following after the U.S., and this is a cultural influence, uh, much the same way of life. Uh, at, at, the, at the summit today, uh, the, the head of uh, the wellness programs at the Cleveland Clinic uh, said that he believed that the U.S. were was stabilizing as, as it related to, to obesity. But, but it's bad enough. I mean, there's 100 million people that are, are obese here and having a significant higher risk of, of developing uh, chronic disease and premature death, basically. And, you know, we mentioned earlier when we started you know, that, that uh, $3.6 billion commitment to new diabetes drugs. There are people who look at how obesity is treated now or how diabetes is treated now, 
injections of insulin, um, artificial pancreas, different monitors. You're looking into the future with that. You know, for the public, how will these um, afflictions be treated differently, um, either in how they take insulin or other, other solutions that are just over the horizon? Well, I think we, we, need, uh, we need several approaches. Uh, if, if we could make uh, an artificial pancreas uh, by, by combining uh, beta cells that produce insulin, uh, encapsulating them with some kind of either being insulin or glucose sensitive or with a continuous glucose monitor that supports the uh, artificial pancreas, uh, that would, of course, uh, help certain individuals that have a very difficult and brittle diabetes that cannot manage themselves with the means we have today. But it is not likely in a foreseeable future to be the solution to the millions and millions and millions of people. We, we're serving a little bit more than 20 million people for their daily consumption of insulin. And, and an artificial pancreas is, is not going to be for, 20 mil for these 20 million people. Uh, so, so we are we're working on a on a on a different on a different direction, which is one of trying to make the insulin is amenable for the patients, so that they can live normal lives. And uh, this this is done by making the insulin either faster or longer acting or more predictable. And in the future, the the commitment that you mention is is a commitment that we that we have stated that. Uh, that we can foresee that we, over the next five, seven years, will have to invest about three to four billion dollars in, in the development of all version of what used to be injections. So we do believe in the future it may be possible to deliver insulin in a, in a pill, hmm. uh, which would which transform the way for many people uh, that would prefer not to take injections. Uh, so, so that's the commitment, and that's so. So we're basically working in the in the area of trying to molecular change uh, the drugs that we're making to make it more convenient for the patients. Others are working on devices which tries to do the same thing, and but I think both is needed. Mm -hmm. Lars, thanks so much for your comments today. Um, someone asked the CEO of Cleveland Clinic, um, Dr. Cosgrove, what he was going to what he proposed about the spiraling cost of healthcare. And I thought he gave an honest answer. He says, nothing. We really can't do anything about the spiraling cost of health care until we get prevention under control. That's correct. And um, one of the things that you notice, I've been to Denmark, and you get off a plane in Denmark, and you'll notice very, very thin people. <laughs> and I think most of us will notice uh, that have some, starring, <laughs> yeah, and have some age. We're not though. Have some age and have some gray hair. Body types are very, very different than when we were growing up. And so clearly we've seen this burgeoning of obesity and so forth. When you look at Denmark, where people can get on bicycles and go to work, uh, most of us aren't going to get on a bike and travel to Indiana for a business meeting. We're going to get in a car. So we have this different lifestyle versus countries like Denmark. What are your thoughts on urban planning and uh, many business leaders in this room tonight and uh, a lot of the uh, literature and the education I've seen on urban planning and true development focuses on getting communities involved with trying to make healthier lifestyles for their populace. Your yeah, thoughts? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that question. I think urbanization is tremendously important and it is something that, that we are starting to look at in, in our company as a way of addressing the problem. Uh, in, in 2050, 70 percent of the global population will be living in cities. The reason being obvious that people are attracted to cities because in cities there are opportunities, there are services, and it's easier to provide those services in the city. But what happens is, of course, it becomes congested. Uh, you get longer transportation, you get air pollution. Uh, it becomes unsafe, perhaps, uh, to travel from one point to the other. So I think urban planning needs to, uh, to put in place structures where people can commute in a different way than what we have typically commuted if we're able to commute short term or short distances to our workplace. But obviously some people will have jobs uh, where they're going to travel 50 miles, 100 miles uh, to see customers or do things and, and that is of course not something you do on a bicycle and not at least every day I'd suggest. So I think there you need to, th 
to hope for the fact that if we change the mindset of children and the young, that they will accumulate a lifestyle which would prompt them, since they have not been driven by a car to school every day, they found the joy of riding a bicycle and being fit uh, and built that into their life also when they go to high school and perhaps when they go to college. It becomes so much part of their life that they think about this and have enough mental surplus and capacity to, if they can't do it in connection with their job, then do it afterwards somehow or another. Then I would also submit that the employers has a huge responsibility. I mean, after all, we spent most of our waking hours at, at the job. And so I think employers has an enormous obligation of providing a healthy food choice, smoke-free environment, and access to some kind of exercise. And by doing so, it's in their own interest because they are likely to lower uh, the, the retiree health pro, uh, cost and, and the premiums on their health insurance in the process. And they may also improve the productivity of the workforce in the process and, and lessen the absenteeism. So it's not the one thing we can do. It's, it's a comprehensive thing that we need to do. And, uh, and then at the end, we, as pharmaceutical companies, uh, will, of course, have to work with the healthcare sector and, and trying to care for the people as best as we can once they get the disease, but we should try to avoid it altogether. Lars, thank you so much for joining us here today. Um, I just took a brief poll uh, whether I should ask a question about Obamacare or the FDA, and we're going with Obamacare. Um, <laughs> you lose either way. So, <laughs> I think I speak for everybody in the room when, we, when, when I say we'd like to hear your thoughts on the current debate over, over health care reform or health insurance reform, however you want to frame it. We'd be curious to know how you see it and how you think we could best perhaps get out of our own way. Not that I have an opinion. My personal here again, and I emphasize my personal view of this, there's no way you can get away from not offering health services to everyone. Uh, you have to excuse me if this is my cultural upbringing. I, it's, to me, it's inconceivable. It's not dignified not to ha have people covered by basic health care services. And so, so th that to me is, I, mean, I, I can't see you can roll that back. The next thing is then can you put in place uh, insurance uh, schemes that are priced in a way where it is not going to be detrimental to small businesses and to private contractors and, and thereby putting them out of business. And this is of course where it's going to get tricky. Uh, but let's see. Uh, I'm optimistic. Uh, there are, I have understood there's been some system glitches in in starting up the exchanges. Uh, I gotta believe you can put a man on the moon, you gotta be able to put a software system together where you can register insurance. I mean, <laughs> th this, this cannot be, I mean, this, I know it's complicated, and we've all that work in companies, we've all tried to introduce new healthcare systems uh, or new uh, IDP system, and it's always failing, and it's always become more expensive and complicated, but you can do it. I mean, there's no question about this. Uh, so I, I think you just got to get on with it. And, and maybe, the, and we'll follow up on that. You know, as you look at the, the oh, do we have a question? I'm sorry. <laughs> do, do you have a, do you, have a um, you look at the holdup between political parties. Is that something you would see um, in your country? I mean, would you see the debate where they would hold the country's budget and, and step forward over an issue like health care? When you see that from, from your vo point of view, when you see the, the debate and the, and the gridlock, um, well, well, it's, it's an interesting question because we see increasingly in Europe le local national legislation being put in place which obliges countries to have a certain limitation on their budget uh, deficits, much like you have. And, and these legislations are put in place obviously to, to mitigate the fact that politicians typically tend to hand out gifts because they want to get re-elected. Re and so taking long-term structural 
uh, decisions uh, is, is very painful for politicians. And they, they become very unpopular. So they wait doing that until it really hits the ditch, right? And, and so that's why these types of legislations are put in place. In my country, we don't have that at the moment. Uh, and so we have a, as, a, as a tradition that all the parties vote for the next budget, even though they don't like it. The only, the only party that doesn't do that is the, the remnants of the old Communist Party. Uh, but all the, other, all the other parties vote in favor of the budget because they know we've got to run the country. And then at the next time we have budget uh, negotiations, uh, then we'll try to get something more uh, in favor of our policy. And if not, then we throw the politicians out and, and, and we vote for somebody else. Uh, when election comes. And we have mandatory elections uh, every four years. So that's the way it works. Uh, and, and I can tell you, we have been close to bankrupt in Denmark. I, when, I, when I came out of college uh, and, and needed to, to get a job, uh, interest rates were 15%. When I got my first mortgage, uh, I had to pay back my house uh, in 15 years and the interest rates were 15%. And uh, the, the country, used a large part of our, our public budget to pay off debt that we had incurred in earlier years. So I know exactly where you are. And it took 15, 20 years of austerity and really reduced lifestyle, quality of life to get through that. And the question is, are you up for it? There's no way you can go on owing other people a lot of money. And at the end of the day, they'll end up deciding what you can do. It's so simple. I mean, we know it all. I mean, if, if we mortgage everything to the bank, then the bank decides. So it's, 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 a, difficult, it's a difficult question. And so from what I heard is that this expression, you know, they're probably going to kick it down, they kick the can down the street, uh, which is in a way, in a way it's, well, it solves the problem right now, but it doesn't solve the real problem. And so it's just going to come back to roost at the end of the year or whenever the next milestone is. So you, they've they got to have some bipartisanship and, and find a real long-term solution to how much debt are we going to take, how are we going to deal with taxes, how are we going to deal with entitlement. And it's, you, know, you ask economists, they know what they have to do. All the economists would agree, more or less, so at least if you take them from the, the mid uh, of, of the environment, but it's, it's getting around to accepting that that's what we have to do. I won't ask an FDA question, but I'll ask a general question. You can, I, I don't want to. Uh, <laughs> uh, again, another kind of perception question, and you touched on this a little bit in your talk about defining American innovation, and maybe you've seen it in part through the FDA, right? You've had uh, court rulings on generic drugs. You've had questions on FDA about diabetes. You've had to go through that process multiple mm -hmm. times to get your products to market. You know, when you look at both regulatory and, and educationally and otherwise, how, how would you define and contrast American innovation versus innovation that emanates or is, is run through other countries? Well, the regulatory process in, in the United States is slightly different than it is uh, in Europe. In Europe, it's a more closed process. It's not a public event. It's a, it's a group of experts representing uh, the different countries uh, that evaluates the dossier. And, and based on that expert evaluation, uh, you get a, either a thumbs up or a thumbs down. In the United States, it's, it's more become also a, a public, uh, tra more transparent process in that FDA typically in relationship to new drugs tend to hold advisory panel uh, where the public is invited in to see. Uh, it has the advantage that there's at least some level of transparency, which there is not in Europe. And, uh, but uh, the problem is uh, sometimes uh, these panels can be quite tricky. I mean, it's, it's sort of like a performance of the day. Uh, it, can, it can tilt in one direction or the other. Uh, so it becomes uh, a little bit more erratic in that sense, whereas in Europe we don't have any transparency and that has led to the public in Europe demanding for transparency. So there's a, a movement at the moment uh, 
demanding uh, the European medical agencies to release all the data uh, on which drugs has uh, been approved for the public to scrutinize uh, whether it's been an appropriate thing or a non-appropriate thing uh, to approve these drugs. But both agencies are working together and I, I mean there's now a, a, an opening of a free trade, uh, free trade agreement negotiations between the United States and, and Europe and even though I think uh, the healthcare area and, re and regulation of drugs and foods uh, are probably going to be the most difficult parts of that free trade agreement, I think it's going to bring the parties closer together because what we see is that we need clarity. I mean, what business really wants is clarity. Sometimes we even say we don't really care how difficult it is as long as we know what it is. Because that means we can decide to invest or not to invest. And so if there's different requirements in Europe and different requirements in the United States, it prevents business from making good business decisions. So to the extent to which they could work together and harmonize the requirements from Europe and the United States, it would be beneficial for us. Which do you like better? Well, I mean, I, I've not, I, my, my winning streak in, in the United States is not so good. <laughs> uh, so, but uh, I don't like losing, so we keep coming back. Mm -hmm. And there's no, I mean, FDA is, is king. You know, they, they basically are the gatekeepers of us getting to the market or not. And there is, with the, the size of the U.S. market and, and the nature of the U.S. market, there's no way you can be successful as a pharmaceutical company and yes, you get your products to the market in the United States. And so it is just simply something we have to learn to work with. And, uh, and we do. So, no, no, it's not a, it's not a problem. It's just something we, we need to work with. Well, thank you very, very much for this fantastic conversation. Thank you. Very pleased. Uh, thank our speaker. Thank you. I have to do a, hold on, I have to do a quick wrap here. Today at the City Club, we've been listening to a special program featuring Lars Sorensen, the President and CEO of Novo Nordisk. Thank you, Mr. Sorensen. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This program is now adjourned. <laughs>